Welcome to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Laura Kortner is our executive producer and Anita Brockington, our engineer. You know, every year that we can, 21st Century Radio features local Maryland efforts that enhance our ecosystems. This hour, we're joined by Anne Hairston Strang, who is Associate Director of Statewide Programs for the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service. She's going to talk to us about not only the importance of trees, because they're vital to the air we breathe, but why they help keep our ecosystems intact and help us bring down the carbon footprint contributing to global warming. One Acre Forest, their website teaches us, absorbs six tons of carbon dioxide and produces four tons of oxygen. When you compare that in this formula, the state of Maryland is comprised of 6,212,634 acres, and of that, 2,462,000 acres are forests, so that's helping all of us. And of course, for those that know Maryland well, hickory and oak are primary trees. Our Maryland state tree, for the sake of information is the white oak and it's the most abundant species of oak growing in our state and is found in every county and baltimore city with that said it's a pleasure to welcome our guest thank you so much for joining us Anne harrison strang thanks so much for having me oh it's an absolute pleasure all right so firstly i thought the maryland state tree was dogwood that's Virginia. Ah, wrong state, Sohara. <laughs> so on the other side of the Potomac, it's uh, the white oak, That's Corcus so... alba. So one of the things that you all do is you look at the whole spectrum, as I reported, of all these millions of acres in our land and make decisions about the forest canopy, how to, you know, preserve the land. Talk to us about the analytic process that the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service uses. Uh, to look at extent or well like the, your forest uh, action and, plan you have a very particular plan of action that's based on an analysis of what the state needs well there's a lot of different analyses um some of it is looking at extent some of it is looking at health um, and some of it is looking at the the, the kinds of uh, values that we want out out uh the other end from our forest that you were talking about from water quality to carbon sequestration to wildlife habitat um, i like to think of forests as a, a great moderator it's sort of what helps make our whole area really livable and that has a role to play in our air quality so it you know keeps down the heat island effect at the same time it's uh, sequestering carbon and it's filtering water and when you look at streams it makes those streams livable for the fish um and that's it's sort of what our natural systems around here were adapted to so it's sort of a cornerstone of a lot of the functions right exactly and when you look at ecosystems as a whole and we have so much wetlands the trees around the wetlands are as significant as the wetlands themselves to like preserving ecosystems and keeping the nourishments in the soil, um, as well as feeding the aquatics and the birds that migrate. What are the things when you first started, I don't even know how long you've been working with the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service, but what drew you into this kind of work? Um, well, I interested in forestry because I really liked the renewable aspect of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, liked, I wanted to learn more about natural systems, but then uh, I was looking at kind of, kind of the options out there, there and the renewable is sustainably and we can get, you know, all the, you know, habitat and wildlife benefits, you know, in one time. And then if we manage it right, we can get it again and again, for, you mm -hmm. know, for each succeeding generation. So that's sort of what really draws me, excites me about this whole um, realm of work. Um, I joined Maryland Forest Service um, about 21 years ago as the riparian specialist. Um, I had just gotten my PhD in uh, forest hydrology and I have a master's in forest soils and a bachelor's in forest resource management. Wow. So, 
Um, so that's, you know, what I came to them with. And so I've really come up from that watershed perspective, looking at um, how forests are functioning on our landscape for water quality. Exactly. And, and you know, it's so funny. I've been looking at these efforts worldwide of restorations of wetlands and mm -hmm. unfortunately, how so often they're um, not treasured for what they were. But given we have this, you know, inland estuary, there maybe there's a little bit more awareness here. What are some of the challenges we have currently to our wetlands? Probably some of our development patterns and, and how we do, you know, drainage and runoff. Um, we have some pretty significant uh, sets of regulations in Maryland. It's better than it is some places. But still, I mean, the, the things that we have to, that we do to, you know, keep us safe and secure and healthy, um, you know, end up paving things and it has, it has some impacts downstream. So uh, I, there's a lot more we could do in terms of managing stormwater and uh, increasing tree canopy cover. So urban tree canopy cover as well as riparian buffers. Uh, as well as just putting as much tree canopy out there, because it's part of the big cycle. Um, trees are the best uh, land use for infiltrating, so letting that water soak in during the rainfall. And then there's a really significant role in transpiration. Um, so, you know, trees get really big, they have a lot of surface area, and they're putting out, you know, in contributing to that atmospheric cycle as well. A lot of folks have you know, learned the water cycle. So if you take trees out of the landscape, you're short circuit in a little part of that, that water cycle. When people you know, develop land, either as individuals or developers, and they take down trees, are there any laws in our state currently about how many you have to replant for every tree you take down? Um, well, it's not that simple. Um, there's a lot of laws. Um, we have, uh, one of the earliest laws was, uh, about pine trees. But if you're talking about development, um, there's the critical area law that has certain, uh, restrictions just within that thousand feet from tidal waters. And there, if you, you know, take, uh, area out of a buffer, you have to replace it in that um, outside of the buffer. It depends on which category of land you're in, resource conservation area, limited development area, or intensely developed area. Um, and then we have the Forest Conservation Act for land outside of the critical area and except in Allegheny and Garrett counties. That's interesting. Is there is there any law that you've seen in other states that you and think, gee, if Maryland had that, it would be to our advantage? There, it's um, at this point the local jurisdictions, the local jurisdictions, a, a city that has its own rules, they can set the ratios that they think are most. Is that making sense? We're having a little interruption with your signal for some reason. Um, so we'll just continue on and we'll see if it improves. Or... I'm sorry. That's all right. Sometimes this happens in radio. So in terms of what was it, Washington, D.C., you were saying that has its own jurisdiction? Yeah. There we go. All right. We're going to take a little break if you're just joining us. And Herstron Strang is joining us and she is from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service. She is the Associate Director of Statewide Programs and we'll be right back. I admit to being a tree lover for lots of reasons, and because I love trees, I want to urge each of you to be sure your trees are divine. Trees improve the value of our property and the air we breathe, but many trees are dying because wild vines are strangling them. You can help make your tree divine. Cut the base of the vines at the bottom of the tree with saw or clippers. The vines will die off, and in another season, you can pull them out of the trees. Wear gloves. Many vines are poisonous oak. But don't wait. Save your trees in your backyard or neighborhood. Share this tip with others you know. Save the trees. Make your trees the divined trees of Maryland. 
Hi, this is Ann Rabe, and I'm with the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice, CHEJ. We're a national environmental health group, and you can reach us at www.chej.org. You're listening to 21st Century Radio and the very interesting talk show of Dr. Zohara Hieronymus. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. Our guest is Ann Hairston Strang from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Server Service. You can find them online at www.dnr.maryland, spelled out, .gov forward slash forest. That's www.dnr.maryland.gov forward slash forest. So on that theme, Ann, um, about the vines, I mean, I can't tell you how upset I get when I drive looking in Baltimore City at all these beautiful old stands uh, along the highway. And I just feel like there people don't understand that ivy might be pretty growing up a wall, but it's killing, strangling to death all our trees. Yeah, and vine removal is um, one of our responses to, you know, climate change that we recommend for yeah. landowners. So, and it's it's sort of symptomatic of some of the ecological change that, that we see on our land. You know, when we have a settled landscape, there's some really significant things that change, and I can get to that in a bit, but you're asking about the vines. So, um, generally, we're seeing more vine growth these days than we used to. Exactly. So uh- it's really helpful to, if people will take those kind of measures that were just recommended um, in terms of clipping it at the base. You don't have to pull it out of the whole tree. You can just clip it at the base and let it die back. Exactly. Well, because if you pull them off and you pull them off prematurely, you can injure the arc, the bark, and the bark is the skin of the tree, and then they get infected and bugs. But, you know, I noticed it was about 10 years ago, and at first I thought maybe it was something that had come in from the ports, and then I thought maybe it had come in with, you know, some sort of mulching, That and now it's everywhere. I, when I drive through Baltimore City neighborhoods like um, Mount Washington or Roland Park, and I see all these beautiful old oaks and maples and elms being strangled to death and the neighborhood's beautiful or I even went to the Mount Washington Arboretum which is just a lovely well cared for place but it is surrounded entirely on all sides by trees that are being strangled to death and I just feel that people aren't educated and maybe there's some way we can send flyers home with the schools you know that's how recycling started in this country and became what it became is flyers went home and schools leaked school children backpacks Mm-hmm. Um, the birds are spreading a lot of the, the vines that, that you see, and some of them are, you know, exotic species. They're invasive. The oriental bittersweet, the porcelain berry, um, in addition to the uh, English ivy that you mentioned, um, very common vines. And, um, you know, your, your tree, it, it attracts wildlife, and so the birds perch on it. And so then they're, you know, they are planting a lot of these vines, so unless oh, we, you know, you know uh, be some of the ecological pushback that we used to have with, like, fire and things like that, um, now it's sort of up to people to do that kind of stuff. So to everybody, um, I want to go ahead. point out um, some of the good work that Baltimore Green Space has been doing, um, that they offer some education right there in, in Baltimore um, about some of these uh Forest Patch First Aid, they call it, uh, and they'll help people learn about how to, you know, take care of the forest patches in their area, community open space. And what about the trees along the meridians and along, you know, what's still, uh, I guess it would be considered county property? I remember stopping some county people who were doing tree trimming and then there was a telephone company doing tree trimming of course I said to them Mm -hmm. well can you all just clip all these vines while you're at it and in both instances they said well that's not our job so how can citizens in each of their locales whether it's the county the city a subdivision um, do more about this if they feel they themselves can't do enough right well so if it is you know a, you know, county or state uh, property, then it's, you know, the responsibility of the landowner. There's not a law that says you have to do that. Um, but I know, like, 
state highways. Uh, if if you've seen some patches along the highways where they really have gone in and you know tried to tackle the problem in places where it was you know getting bad on the edge of the road, um, it really can uh, reduce the life of a tree a lot. So you know it's a it's a good maintenance step. It's just expensive, so it comes down to resources. You know what do you you know what do you do first? Right, but it's not expensive for everybody who lives in a neighborhood or has a neighborhood community association. Mm -hmm. If you want to take this on, and I highly recommend how important it is because it doesn't just reduce the life of the tree, it kills them. I mean, we have these enormous stands on certain routes in Baltimore County where the entire stands along the road are dying, and they are completely swallowed in vines. It's not just a little reduction. You can already see the upper branches have died, and that tree will die if somebody doesn't Mm -hmm. cut them. So at one point, I was thinking of making little flyers and stuffing mailboxes, and I realized, Mm -hmm. oh, I'm one person. I can't exactly handle this alone. Ray, have you looked into some of the Weed Warrior program? No, tell us about that. Oh, Weed Warriors is um, something that was uh, started um, in Prince George's County and has sort of spread to do that sort of thing. So, um, you know, Baltimore City has a program and Arundel County has a program. Um, you know, so that's something where people are, you know, learning, um, you know, getting taught what's appropriate to take this. I mean, in amongst some of the invasive vines that are really spreading, there's some, you know, native local vines. You don't necessarily want to wholesale remove everything. You want to learn a few species that are really problematic and make sure you're targeting them. Exactly. And and some, of course, the birds feed off and they need the berries that grow on them. But the English ivy just seems really prominent here in Baltimore County. I'm not sure why. Mm. So another program you all have, and I love talking about this program, is your Tree Mendus Maryland. Share yeah. with our audience what that's all about. That is... Um, a program where we make available lower cost trees for community open space planting. So it is a program that's targeted at like public and community ground. So it's not like, you know, for your your yard. We have another program for that. But it is something where you know we basically use that that power of collective buying to bring a lower cost and then, you know, we help um guide the choices towards native trees, and you know, basically local jurisdictions can do more affordable tree planting. It's uh, a containerized tree, and so it's a good size for volunteer plantings. Um, you know, it's big enough to not be trampled by your volunteers, but, but it's also small enough to be able to be picked up and uh, planted. And you also have programs like forest stewardship, urban and community forestry. Share Mm -hmm. with us a bit about those. So you got a little bit into our program areas. So Tremendous is, you know, one part of our urban and community forestry program. Then we have forest stewardship, which is helping people um, take care of and manage the trees sort of on the bigger parcels, you know, again, because we changed the ecology on the landscape. You know, fire is gone, invasive species have gotten added, and there's a whole lot more deer than, you know, was historically normal. We we need to be a little more active in our forest management if we want to even end up with our normal native species. Mm-hmm. So we help landowners with forest stewardship plans. So if somebody um, in the listening audience says, yeah, I live out, you know, in one of the counties and I have 10 acres and five of the acres mm-hmm. is woods and I notice the woods aren't doing really well, would they call the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service? Yeah, so um, that would they would have uh, enough uh, property to get a forest stewardship plan for us. There is... Also, um, other resources out there that where you can help learn about forest health. There's the Woods in My Backyard program that Extension has. Oh, wonderful. Um, and there's Forests for the Bay, that Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, for some of those smaller landowners that may, you know, have a few acres but not 10, 20, 30 that are more, you know, practical for forest management. So people with larger parcels can call 
the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service, and then somebody can come out and look at the forest for them? Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, that's yeah, wonderful. Now there is, there is a, a cost to develop the plan. Sure. Um, if you, that's the, the path that you want to take, um, and we try and keep that pretty modest. There's also consulting foresters out there if you want somebody um, to, you know, have go that route and have somebody sort of on, on call. Uh, you know, we, we certainly come out. We have to, you know, manage with how many people are calling at that particular time. Sure. How interesting. So in your urban and community forestry program, are these programs for adults or are they for youth? I mean, who attends these kinds of programs? Well, we have a real range of programs. So, you know, obviously there's, you know, there's everything from, uh, we do some just wonderful school plantings and we have volunteer forestry boards. If anybody's interested, um, we do have volunteer forestry boards in every county. Some of them do uh, help us with a lot of school plantings. Um, we have programs like uh, Gift of Trees. So even if you know maybe you're you know not at a place in your life where you're going to go out and plant a tree, but you you want to see a tree planted and you want to contribute to that, uh, you can donate 40 acres or uh, 40 acres. We planted more than 40 acres <laughs> for the program. Right. Forty dollars um, uh-huh. for a tree for the Gift of Trees program, um, and a tree will be planted in honor of whoever you want to name. Um, My coworkers gave me a a Gift of Trees when my first son was born. It was really wonderful. How beautiful. You know, there was another thought I had was, yeah, if only we could plant a tree for every child born in Maryland and connect it Mm -hmm. to all the hospitals. I mean, I'm always thinking about the trees, to be quite frank, and like what kinds of things could we do that would inspire people to plant more, take care of them better? I mean, I am such a tree lover. I don't think there's anything in nature I love more to start with than trees. Of course, I love all the animals, but I have a very special fondness and always have, I think, since my mom stuck me in a tree when I was three years old, walked away and said, now get down. (laughs) (laughs) They are amazing. They just really are. Well, and I think there's Um, some awareness now. Have you gotten your Marylanders plant tree coupon? No. So that's one of our other programs. Talk Um, to us about that. Uh, so, you know, in addition to the Tremendous program that, you know, covers sort of public open space and the gift of trees, which is, you know, donate, you know, donate for, to plant a tree in somebody's honor, Marylanders Plant Trees is, well, let's, let's just help people plant trees in their yard. So uh-huh. it's a $25 coupon. You can download it off the internet and you can save $25 for any tree, $50 or more at participating nurseries. So we have 43 native trees on the list, uh, and the participating nurseries are, are on the uh, website as well. And there's we have really quite a few. So there's usually it, there's some pretty accessible throughout most of the state. And what's the program called again? Marylanders Plant Trees. Oh, beautiful. A coupon program. I'm getting such a nice education along with the audience tonight. Marylanders plant mm -hmm. trees. Yeah. So we and yeah, there's just a lot of a lot of wonderful programs. So when you look at the, you know, right now with the Amazon burning and Africa burning and fires in Russia, I mean, there are fires all over the planet right now. And as we have warmer and warmer seasons and hotter and hotter summers, uh, when they spark, they're more devastating than perhaps at other times. While most people are aware of the fires in the Amazon right now, thankfully, because they've received so much press, maybe aren't aware of the devastation that's literally happening in other continents. Um, Talk to us a bit about Maryland's um, burn strategy and what the forestry department does or doesn't do regarding that. So it, it's um, interesting you brought that up because we are shipping a crew right now um, to help with fires in California. Uh-huh. So it's been really a pretty wet year um, throughout a lot of the U.S. Yeah. So we're just sending out our first crew. Normally we would have sent one out. Um, In terms of our overall strategy statewide, um, you know, fire suppression around our communities is is our top priority, um, just for human health and safety. Now, that said, we have 
a fire prevention program, our FireWise Maryland program, so that, you know, you are trying to do what you can in and around your community so that wildfire doesn't spread and, you know, kill people or burn homes. Um, we also have a prescribed burn program. Uh, and, you know, in our state land management, you know, we have areas where we're ecologically trying to, to manage and we're, we do um, run prescribed burns on, in some of those areas to get some of the native ecology uh, back in those, you know, particularly lower shore, um, a fire adapted landscape that we, you know, basically because we have a settled uh, landscape, we suppress a lot of fires. The prescribed fires, we try and get on the landscape in a very controlled manner so you can get those ecological benefits but not, you know, have the, the harm to, to people uh, or to animals or, you know, smoke on the roadways that would again lead to accidents or something like that. So all that has to be managed when we're trying to put fire back in the system the way it used to be. What, for those that may not know, what are some of the ecological benefits of controlled burn? Um, it it kind of hits the reset button on the nutrients, um, and there's just some ecological adaptations in our plants that uh, they, they depended on that uh, that stimulus. Some uh, species of pine, uh, their, their cones stay tightly closed until they run through a fire. After the fire, the, the cones is sort of melted the cone open and so like, you know, popcorn or something. And then the seeds are available right when you have the, those burned, uh, the nutrients that got released in the burn. Um, and the seed, and the biggest deal is there's light. Um, a lot of plant growth is just competition for light. Right. I, I ended up uh, spending a couple of years of my master's looking at um, interactions between nutrients and topography and how close to the water it was. Yeah. And all of that was important, and I found good results. But I also found that the biggest factor that I could find in all of those things, whether it's nitrogen or water, it was light. The fastest growth I had was where there had been like a canopy gap in the trees. Mm -hmm, because there was that, more light. Yeah. So when we're when we're managing forests, it's a lot about managing light. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and I was reading on your website, and if you're just joining us, Ann Hairston Strang is with us from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service, and you can learn more at their website, www.dnr.maryland, spelled out, dot gov, forward slash forest. I was reading that, you know, in an average year, you write that the Maryland Forest Service responds to an average of 325 wildfires that burn more than 3,200 acres of forest bush and grasses, and that the department responds, the fire departments respond to over 5,000 wildfire incidents per year. Are, are many of these like accidentally caused, like people, you know, having campouts or, you know, when we were kids, my mother used to rake the leaves and we burned them. And now mm -hmm. that's not legal, but growing up, everybody burned their leaves. Right. Well, it's still legal in a lot of places, but there's, there's regulations, um, but it is still the leading cause of wildfire. It, it is. is. Just, um, yeah, you know, and we have, we have rules, you know, it, it's, you can burn after 4 p.m. because temperatures are usually declining then. You need to have, um, you know, water available. You need to have it a certain distance from, you know, buildings. You need to have vegetation away from where you're burning, you know, 10 feet and, you know, have those control. If people are really following the regulations that we have, usually you don't get the escapes, but, you know, not everybody pays attention. The wind will pick up a little bit and it'll mm -hmm. just surprise somebody and it can just really get away. Mm -hmm. So in Maryland, we have spring and fall fire seasons typically. And remember I talked about how trees were so protective? Our fire season is really about when the trees are not green. 
So it's before leaf out in the spring Mm -hmm. is one of our fire seasons. And after the leaf falls in the fall, you know, and as soon as the leaves come out of that canopy, the sun can just reach down and dry a whole lot more than during our nice green summer. We can still have summer fires when we have real droughts, but our, you know, most predictable fire seasons are in that summer and fall. Mm -hmm. I have a friend that lives out in Argonne, and they have had so little rain in the last three years, and last year, I mean, she was constantly having to prepare all of her animals. She runs an animal sanctuary for evacuation because there were so many fires all of the time. Yeah. Um, and, and again, due to just the dryness that was inordinate. Right. And and a lot of our um, counties also have uh, air quality regulations. So, you know, in addition to the danger of fire, there's the air quality issues. And so that's why some counties, they don't want you to, to burn anymore because just there's too many people. Right. Right. Exactly. Well, look, we're going to take a little break. Our guest is Ann Hairston Strang. She joins us from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service. Ann is the Associate Director of Statewide Programs. And when we return, we'll talk some more about other things they do. Hello, my name is Ronell Mitchell Hawkins, 4 H educator for University of Maryland Extension. You can learn more about our programs and youth development at www.extension.umd.edu. You are listening to 21st Century Radio with Dr. Zohara Haraneman. Welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I love the University of Maryland's Extension program, and they have this beautiful uh, Master Gardener's Demonstration Garden on Shawan Road in Cockeysville, Maryland. If you've never been there, you must go see what they do. And they're all Master Gardeners, and they're all trained there, and um, they really show you what an indigenous garden looks like both from edibles to non-edibles to pollinators they have a children's garden anyway it's a beautiful place with a lovely view of the valley um, and it's across from Argonne Ridge so then you can go across the street and go for walks over at Argonne Ridge which is just I don't think it's over a thousand acres anyway if you're just joining us Ann Hairston Strang is with us and um, she is the associate director of statewide programs for the department, and I didn't realize until I went to your website how large our forestry industry is, that it's the fifth largest industry in the state, and that 18,000 people depend on forest products industry for their livelihood, and you write that in Garrett and Allegheny counties, it's the single largest employer and on the eastern shore, whether it's, you know, forest supply, woods for homes, furniture, paper products. How does that get managed? I mean, there's always concern about how much paper we use, how much wood is being used, whether hemp wood would be better because hemp goes so grows so quickly. And now there is a movement around the nation for hemp flooring rather than, you know, oak or pine or redwood or whatever. So you remember when I said that I had, was really interested in forestry because of that renewable aspect? Yeah. Um, you know, if, if you're interested in renewability and sustainability um, and resilience, then you, you want to be looking for forest products and, you know, preferably, you know, forest products grown locally and regionally because in the long run, that's what helps us keep forests on the landscape. You know, and from my watershed forestry perspective, that's you know, really what we're after. But... A lot of people don't really know what goes on, I mean, how we do the forest management and how important those forest markets are, not only just for that job and that economic development, but also in allowing us to um, afford to manage for forest health and for sustainable forestry. So um, if if we don't use paper from wood pulp, then that cuts down on the markets for thinning. Remember I said we, we lost landscape-scale fire? That used to thin the forest. Now people have to thin the forest if you want to you know, get to that next step in the forest development. 
Um, and so part of the, you know, sort of virtuous cycle that helps us afford to do that is having the, the pulpwood market. And then if you want, you know, carbon sequestration, um, one of the really good things in terms of life cycle analysis is having um, long-term carbon storage in the products. So when we use our wood to build homes um, and for, you know, furniture and things that then stay used for a long time and also are, you know, wonderful, durable, you know, comfortable parts of our, you know, shelter and fuel and stuff like that. Um, that's, that's what, you know, we're looking to do. Um, so there's a deliberate, you know, people, when you look at um, forests, you'll see older trees that might be a couple hundred years old. You might see a tree that's 100 years old. You might see one that's under 50 years old. And you all prescribe thinning them so that there's more light for the trees. How how does a, a person decide about that? I mean, there might be somebody in the listening audience, because I don't know what your acreage requirement is for somebody from the Maryland Department of Natural Resources Forest Service or even a forestry person to come out. But um, And by the way, what is the acreage? You had mentioned earlier something like over five acres. So some of our cost share programs, you need three acres. Mm -hmm. um, but if, if you're really going to have... Um, like a forest, like a harvest or something, a lot of times you're looking at, you know, 10, 15, 20 acres. And a harvest, um, by that you mean somebody comes out and they show you which trees should be cut down and removed? Or, or you know, you would have somebody say which... You can have a forester mark the trees. Uh -huh. say, you know, and, and so you can... A lot of times what we're doing in a thinning is we're taking out some of the smaller ones. When you're looking at a forest, a lot of times, you know, it, um, both based on the ecology and land use history, a lot of times the woods are about the same age. You know, and some trees are bigger and some trees were smaller. Um, when you don't have the advice of forester, sometimes, you know, they will, the loggers will just say, look, I want to, I just want to take the biggest ones mm -hmm. and we'll leave you lots of other trees. Um, and that's the most profitable for them. And it's not illegal, um, but it's not advisable from the renewability standpoint. Right. It's like removing the grandparent get, from the family. It's, yeah, it's taking the best and leaving the rest. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of times they're about the same age. Because you know, if you... You know, looking at our forested landscape today, you may not um, really understand that, you know, we've had several cycles of deforestation in our history, and this is what's grown back. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind about some of this changes over time, a lot of our forests around Maryland are between 80 and 100 years old. And 80 and 100 years ago, we had almost no deer in Maryland. Really? Yeah. My, my dad grew up in southern Virginia, and he, like, roamed the woods, you know, for years. He said he saw one deer. Wow. Yeah. That was the 30s. So. What, what had um, happened? It's different today. What, what had happened 80 years or 100 years ago that we had such deforestation? Or was it so much land was agriculture? Um, well, we had, it, a lot of that was just deer. So there was also, there also had been deforestation prior to that, but then it regrows. I mean, our, our hardwood systems, when when you cut them, you know, they have this tremendous regrowth capacity. So most of what you're looking at on the landscape is stump sprouts from earlier clear cutting. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Um, yeah, and you know, but there is you know, never underestimate the natural system. There's so much capacity there. So just, you know, learning to work with it and use it. We just did um, six statewide meetings with a forest action plan. And, you know, one of the 
the comments that I'll really never forget. We had a logger come, and he said, you know, I'm right now I'm cutting a piece of property that my dad cut 20 years ago. He got a good harvest off of that, but, but he, you know, left a lot of good trees and really, you know, was trying to leave those desirable ones for later. I'm doing the same thing now, and I'm trying to leave it in a condition so that, you know, my son can do it, you know, in another 20 years. And that's renewability and sustainability. What and happens... All through that interval, you get the wildlife habitat and the yeah. quality and the water quality. Yeah, I mean, I've noticed we have so many deer, they've cleared out the understory, which hurts the birds. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen a rabbit in like five years because there's wow. there's no understory. Well, at least oh, in come the... to my yard. <laughs> <laughs> I think but, the fox on my it's... land eat them, actually. Because <laughs> people said, no, so there's plenty of rabbits in Baltimore County, but you have lots of fox. And I go, oh, yeah, yeah well, you got a point there. But I've noticed <laughs> something in, I do a lot of walking, and I've noticed that, when the older trees start dying, a lot of them start dying at the same time. What what is mm -hmm. is there like just a certain age or like do they have mm -hmm. a big network that goes you know dead time? Um, no. One of the things that we're seeing you know right now on the landscape is um, I think some challenges from having a couple of really wet years, mm -hmm. and now we're hitting the dry time. Yeah. So those wet years are a time when um, some diseases can build up, uh, so like root rots, um, you know, pathogens like that. And then when it dries out, um, you know, they notice that they've lost some of those roots to disease. And that's what and I've noticed is these the massive tree. trees are tipping. They're just literally tipping over out of the ground after we have yeah. a big rain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's been tough weather. Mm -hmm. and. You know, and just like, like people, when trees get older, they're, they're just a little less resilient. Um, you know, if you, you mentioned Oregon Ridge, you know, one of, uh, there was a, they did a, a forest management plan at Oregon Ridge, and the consultant identified uh, a stand right behind the nature center. Right. So said, you know, this is really dense. Um, you need to thin this out. Like, oh, we really don't want to do any harvest, and we're not going to do anything right now. And then Gypsy Moth came. And this was the most dense stand on the entire property. Mm -hmm. And they were, you know, so having that much density that you hadn't reduced, um, you know, and fire had not taken out the density or reduced the density for you, you know, and we didn't choose to manage it. And Gypsy Moth, you know, also an exotic invasive species, uh, just put stresses on it that, you know, because the trees were close together and sort of, you know, starved for resources more than if they had gotten thinned, mm -hmm. and they lost the whole stand. Oh. And, and remember when I said if you, you cut a hardwood tree down, it sprouts from the stump? That's if you cut the tree down while the, the roots are still alive. Mm -hmm. There, it's, you know, it'll... You know, you'll just see the. It's such a fascinating the topic. Leap up. Yeah, but I mean, if the, but you, if the tree dies, and it dies down to the root system, you don't get that. Mm -hmm. So they've they've now spent a whole lot of money reforesting, and I think they've done a nice job. But it's like it would have been a lot more manageable and a whole lot less expensive if we had been able to do it through forest management. How interesting. It's it's a really fascinating topic. You know, I posted on Facebook um, painted trees. They're, they have places all over the world where people are painting trees. And someone asked me, was well, the paint good for the trees? And I said, well, gee, I know if it's acrylic, it'll smother them. Is there any kind of paint that people can actually paint the base of a tree, you know, because they do it for a decorative reason where it keeps it okay? Um, I, I don't know that I know that much about it. I would yeah. think if you're painting... Um, you know, mostly just the surface and aren't trying to, you know, paint every crack and crevice, it shouldn't hurt the tree particularly. Yeah, somebody from India actually wrote me because they had seen some pictures I'd posted of various places in the country. Well, anyway, we are almost out of time. Um, is there anything we didn't touch on, a program or something you want to leave us with? Um, 
there's a couple of resources I would love for your listeners to know about if okay. they want to know um, planting trees in Maryland and they want to know, well, how do I find out more about my disease or how do I pick a tree for my yard? Um, you mentioned extension programs. They have the Home and Garden Information Center on okay. the University of Maryland website. Great. So Home and Garden Information Center has lots of information about uh, diseases and native species. And if you're trying to do tree selection, the Native Plant Center on the Alliance for Chesapeake Bay website is a wonderful resource. It's based on native plants for wildlife habitat and conservation landscaping that the Fish and Wildlife Service put out. Thank you so much, Anne. It's been a wonderful hour. Learn more at www.dnr.maryland.gov forward slash forest. Stay connected and stay informed on the number one news talk station. Talk Radio 680, WCBM, Baltimore, and WCBM.com.